Welcome to Sweet Life Solutions, and this is Telling Our Story, and I'm your host, Cheryl Dennis. We are here in Huntsville, Alabama today to interview Jeremy Anderson. Jeremy has been here most of his life, having been born in Dallas, Texas, but here in Huntsville, where he graduated from Oakwood University and also Alabama A&M with a master's in social work. Today, Jeremy is the COO, that's Chief Operating Officer of Spirit Rain Communications, and is the very happy husband of Tracy and a proud owner of three beautiful dogs. Jeremy and his wife live happily here in Madison, and he is a very articulate speaker, but also the author of this book, From Prodigal to Prodigy. And we are here to interview him today so he can tell us all about what led him to write this book and the importance of this book in young people's lives, especially males. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Cheryl. I am so glad to be here. So, Jeremy, I'd just like to start off first by asking you if there were three things that you could pinpoint that you want people to know about you, what would they be? Three important things. Well, Cheryl, the three things that I will say I would like for people to know about me are the three things I love. For one, my wife, Tracy. Two, the ministry. And three, God above who made all of this possible. That's great. Three things, your wife, Tracy. Two, your ministry. And three, God above. Hmm, let's see, where would I start? Let's start with your ministry. What led you to uh, have this ministry, Spirit Rain Communications? Well, Cheryl, Spirit Rain Communications is a company that my father started back in 03. So we used a ministerial resource company with graphic design, web design, layout, the whole nine, as well as publishing. And we have really come into this market strong as far as our publishing. We are a faith-based company and organization, and the Lord has been blessing us tremendously. You know, Jeremy, earlier when we were talking, you told me that you owe your whole life to God. And uh, I just want you to elaborate on that a little bit. Why is that? Well, I say I owe my life to God, quite frankly, because he saved my life. I was raised in a Christian home. I knew right from wrong. But I got caught up and corrupted like a lot of young people do. And I took totally, totally lost my way. My testimony is a little different than the average person. I wasn't just doing drugs or I wasn't just going to the clubs or drinking every blue moon. I was the extreme with all of the issues that I had. Uh, when it comes to heavy dope dealing, uh, multiple nightclubs I was operating, um, fornication and violence, the whole nine. My life was a mess and I knew better. My father is a minister. My grandfather is a minister. My great-grandfather, who's now deceased, was a minister as well. I come from a family of preachers, and I totally got corrupted in my lifestyle. But I praise God that God restores. So I'm not telling you something I read in the book. I'm telling you something I put in the book. Wow. I want to start by asking you, how did you get off track? Because how you got off track is very integral into your ministry with young men. So can you just tell me a little bit about how you got off track? I mean, you, your grandma, your grandfather, your father are ministers. How does a child of someone who obviously had so much spiritual and religious environment get off track? Well, it's funny you ask that, Cheryl. Um, the reality is we're dealing with a spiritual battle here. Um, life is nothing but a saga between good and evil. And although my father and grandfather and others in my life, I've had a number of spiritual um, positive counselors and a lot of spiritual influences in my life. Although that was there, we as Christians and we as people have to make our own choice on whether or not we're going to serve the Lord or the devil. And I began to compromise in my high school and most importantly, my college years. I began to compromise with a lot of things. I said, oh, I'll just do this or I'll just do that. And the next you know I was jumping off of the deep end so I think it begins with that initial compromise my thinking is if the enemy Lucifer then in heaven can fool and deceive a third of the angels he's having a field day with us here on earth and if we don't have our roots grounded deep in the Lord if we don't stay faithful if we don't stay connected and we don't resist temptation even the smallest one we will initially fail one more question about getting off track Jeremy before we get into your book um I've heard a lot of young people who are in church 
say things like, oh, church is so boring and it's not relevant to me. Was that your situation? Did you find that church was boring, uh, that it wasn't relevant to you as a young person? Or did you have resources that were available to you? Well, church for me initially was not boring. I was actually very active in church uh, throughout my years of high school. Church for me was exciting. I participated. I was involved in several different medias. Um, but I've been, I have been to some churches now that have been very um, boring and kind of dry, and that tends to turn our young people away from church, and they start to look at church as lame, uh, quite frankly. So when it comes to that, that can have a really big aspect. For me, that wasn't necessarily the case. I actually did enjoy church. I just, for whatever reasons, began to stray. And I think that my biggest downfall was through my lack of service. See, all throughout high school, I was serving. I was I was speaking, and I was a part of drama groups, and I was in choirs. Ministry was a way of life for me. But I got to a point when I got to college where there was nothing else taking place ministerial or spiritually wise and that's when the enemy kicked in so when I travel and do a lot of speaking which is another ministry I have I make sure that the young people know the importance of Christian service so I want to talk a little bit about your book from prodigal to prodigy um, you said that God gave you this revelation to write this book when was that January 22nd of 2011. I woke up early one Saturday morning and it was very clear what my mission was. I was mentally and physically paralyzed. I just laid there in my bed wow. and the Lord began to just share with me different chapter titles and the book title from prodigal to prodigy. And he was just hitting me upside my head. He was like a lawyer in the courtroom pleading his case. And after about 15 minutes, he broke me free. I was able to wake up and walk around and collect my own thoughts. I instantly went to my computer and I began to type. I said, Lord, if you're telling me what I think you're telling me to give me right now, all of those titles that I was just coming up in my head and all those chapter titles that he gave it all to me one by one and it made sense. And I said, but why the title from prodigal to prodigy? And he said this, he said, son, you've lived years of living a prodigal lifestyle. When you look at the term prodigal, it's wasteful, extravagant, um, just really a mess, just exuberant, just throwing it away, just a wasteful uh, lifestyle. And he said, I want you to live a lifestyle of a prodigal. And when you think of the term prodigal, you think of a child prodigy, someone who is special, uh, extraordinary, very talented. He said, I'm going to take you from your prodigal, your wasteful, wicked lifestyle, and turn you to something extraordinary and special. And that's why I get the book title from Prodigal to Prodigy. But I just want to kind of highlight a few places. Here it says, my experiences after college. And it goes into what you call addictions. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Uh, it talks about women and fornication. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, when it comes to addictions, everything that I began to slowly get into, I said I would just do a little bit of it. And it totally became an addiction from the drug abuse um, to the smoke of cigarettes, all the way to alcohol abuse. Uh, everything that I did um, began to be a necessity for me because there was a void on the inside. I was lacking the Lord in my life. I knew there was an emptiness. I knew that I was called for greater. So to mask the inner pain of failure inside of me, I began to turn to alcohol and I turned to drugs and I turned to tobacco for that temporary relief. And then I turned to women uh, for that satisfaction, that love and fulfillment. And I found myself corrupted by these vices of sin for all almost 10 years. You also um, kind of chronicle that despite your addictions, you were very much a part of the corporate world. Um, and you go into some of your, uh, the club scene. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, when it comes to the club scene, um, I was like most people that just went to the club and hang out. Um, and for a company I was working for, I was able to meet a gentleman that actually I owned a nightclub, and through our relationship and through a partnership, mm -hmm. he gave us the opportunity to begin to um, to promote his club, and then we began to throw on parties, and then we got into the business where we were operating um, our own nightclubs, and uh, this took place for some time and was very successful, as a matter of fact, at this. I'll tell you something. The Lord is not the only one that will bless you. Mm -hmm. The enemy will give you blessings as well, and these are not blessings that will... Um, give you longevity in life. These are blessings that will actually shorten your life. So in the end, they're not really a blessing, it's a curse. But if your perception and your thinking is not intact, you view it as a blessing because it's giving you what ultimately you want, which is not necessarily good for you. You know, recently, Jeremy, I was reading um, 
in a sociology book about dual identity. And you mentioned a little bit about split identity in your book. It's, in fact, on page 40, you say, my mind was cloudy with the impurities of weed, the chase for money, and the love for alcohol. I began to master the role of a split identity. Life for me should have changed some by being a part of the corporate world. I didn't want to totally change my thuggish, reckless ways, so I adapted. Would you say that this is an experience that a lot of young people are going through today, having to adapt and have a dual identity? And can you just talk about how you made it out of that? Actually, what I call the dual identity in a book, I call it, it an identity crisis because that's what I was going through. Mm-hmm. I was going through an identity crisis. From 9 to 5 every day, I met a, with a great company um, doing good work, managing a company, shirt and tie, professional, corporate arena, the whole nine. But once 5 o'clock hit, I was taking off that tie. Mm-hmm. I was throwing on my street gear, smoking and drinking, hanging out with street D-boys, the whole nine. I was just... I was wearing a mask. It was no way that people could see me during work and then see the areas where I was hanging out and the people I was surrounded with. They were two different worlds, and I got to a point to where for a while uh, that was a way of life for me. Chapter 6 references a road trip. And you say here that you had, as you just described, had lost your identity, your money, your career, your self-esteem, your pride, your dignity, and so much more. So can you talk a little bit about that road trip and where it ended? Talks a little bit about your grandfather also. When it came to that road trip, I called that chapter the ride of my life. For doing that road trip, I was able to be um, born again and actually had life again. Uh, I was not working. This is actually right after I lost everything. I lost all the clubs, all the promotional companies, um, all of the drug. My dope connect got tied up and caught up. I didn't have any other way to make any type of income. Um, I literally lost everything. I was at home one day. My grandfather called me, who was a pastor, said he was taking a road trip. I volunteered to take that journey with him, and during that trip, I was converted. Uh, I put myself in a position to where I wasn't able to have any alcohol. Um, there was no nicotine, no tobacco. There was no drugs, of course. There was no secular music. I was really in the presence of the Lord. And so for about 36 hours during this road trip, I didn't have any impurities in my body. And after traveling with my grandfather and then getting to the destination, spending some time with my parents, who was just constantly pouring into my spirit, and then ultimately on the way home, speaking to my grandmother, I heard clearly the voice of the Lord, and I've never been the same since. So you said you heard the voice of the Lord. You've never been the same since. So was this voice... um Jeremy, stop doing what you're doing. Okay. I mean, what was it? When you say the voice of the Lord, what was that? 